Look on here, can I it look says we are live. Welcome to our full documents group. We have John Wayne in the background. I've got people anymore. talking while I'm trying to talk. And uh, <laughs> let's see here. <laughs> yeah, I think it's okay. Whoa, Whoa, that could have been very bad. Whoa, see if that was a nice Wait, you're gonna, down. You're going to have to present here. Are you ready? Uh huh. Four. We have a small but very. Uh, Do I count as a guest speaker? Yeah, we have my wife as the guest speaker today. Check, check. Oh, no, One, two. Be quiet. That was loud. wanted to present. Be quiet. Okay. Yeah, I, I asked him what the format of this was like. He's like, oh, we have to stand up at the beginning and do a presentation on what you read. Perfect. <laughs> Pretty much yeah. works so well yeah. for you, Carl, because you never read it. We've, sure. We've done a good. <laughs> Actually, this time this I read a lot of it. We've yeah, done, We've done awesome. maybe 20 of these. Clearly and every single time. Nobody has read the document oh, before. Why nobody has read the document? Which one should I do? You don't have to. It's okay. I, I don't know at this point. We're, we're live. I'm waiting for my wife to start her presentation. Apparently, I can share out the Google Drive. I don't want to do that right now. Or maybe I do. So we'll put this off to the side. Um, we I need to pull up my just Vatican. It's fine. Just the Vatican? I've yeah. got it on Google Drive over here. Yeah, but you it's have your highlighted over. stuff all over it. But I have one that doesn't oh, have highlighted box. stuff. Okay. Fine, I'll do Vatican. Here, I'll just let you do Whatever. it. Whatever. <laughs> Get out of my way. Stop holding me back. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to be there for all of posterity. Wait, I'm just seeing the Wi-Fi here. Oh, yes. Can you ask Daddy to get that for what you? Would you like? He would like some more raspberry juice. Raspberry juice? It's in the fridge. Anyway. Oh, no. Well, I'm not going to read it out loud right now. <laughs> know, for all our internet stalkers to come over to our house uh -huh. just to steal our Wi-Fi. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi. Sure, why not? Hi. You're so cute. <laughs> also, it's like, oh, right. so taste I too. Know. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Three, oh, seven, six, one. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> anyway, okay, so um, right, you take your if you all want to follow along, I'm going to just start with chapter or paragraph 14, um, which is the first paragraph under the heading, The New Evangelization for the Transmission of Faith. I'm on it, I'm on it, I'm on it. Yay! So some of us are coordinated at least. <clears throat> Sorry. You're asking for a lot. Paragraph. What? Paragraph 14. 14. One Section four. 3. Yeah. What are you Sorry, I'm just, I'm just seeing how. how is the audio working? I don't know. Can you talk into that one over there? Talk into this one? You gotta turn that up. Not right now. How about you go downstairs and play for now, and then if you're still hungry later, Which you can paragraph? have some. Paragraph okay. 14 under Section 3, the new evangelization for the transmission of the faith. Nice. <laughs> oh, I, I think I left out of the the first time I said that. Thank you. This is no terrible. problem. That's what I've been, been reading with five-year-olds too much. Um, Do you see it? You okay yeah. over there? I'm not okay. Do you need reinforcements? I'm looking at the PDF of the webpage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at not a PDF. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. yeah. Whoa, yes, I can hear you. Whoa. I think you might have to change the uh, audio input. I think it's using the web page, right? ah. the uh, web camera. So if you go into your settings, using the webcam. Yeah, hit the hit the gear at the top. <coughs> yeah. And then change it to the USB. Sorry. Um. Yeah. Okay, it's in the USB. It's using USB. The audio codec. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it says. Hey, hey, Katie, talk. Why? 
I can talk just fine. Can you go tap on that microphone? I can. The couch microphone. Okay, that's working. Good. Hey! Okay, I'm, I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna take part from here. That's weird. That's <laughs> really weird. You weirdo. Um, good luck with that. You guys smell. <laughs> you smell. <laughs> I have cookies, so deal with it. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, if you can show. look at chapter 14, Justin, so you can follow along. Now oh, chapter three, paragraph. Oh, 14. sorry, paragraph 14. My bad. Just to confuse everybody. All right, so uh, first off, he basically says that he's writing this exhortation um, in response to the Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, um, who basically gathered to talk about the new evangelization, which is probably something that we've all heard about generally, as younger generations are familiar. Um, and and all, all this is really saying to us is that um, the church's mission is what it has always been, which is basically a missionary activity. Not necessarily to the extent that, like, we all have to go to a... Do I have to look Speaking at... Speaking of missionary activity, I'm trying to get everything oh my gosh. sent out on the web. Oh. Page. Go ahead and stop it. Anyway, continue. Right, keep talking. Tell us about what mission... Or web pages. <laughs> 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 New evangelization. <laughs> so many, yeah. Why don't we have like dual monitor action going on here? Don't get um, me started. <laughs> yeah. So basically, like, just just uh, encouraging people to take advantage of the new evangelization. It's not necessarily new because this is the same mission that we have always had for the last two thousand years. Um, <clears throat> But because God is always making all things new um, and giving us new opportunities to share the gospel, to share um, the message of life and everything, we need to, we need to roll with that, basically, and be continually dynamic ourselves. Um, <clears throat> and especially present it with, with a special mind to the joy of the gospel. You know, like we, Father Ed always kind of jokes around about all those dour-faced portraits of saints that you see, like, it was just, like, that was how people were painted, with just, like, a straight face. But to us, who are so used to people smiling and laughing and stuff yeah, all the time, I mean, like, that seems like, why would I want to do that? They had to for, like, hours. Hours. So. It's hard to smile for hours. Yeah, smile like, that's, yeah, like, that's not real good. Your face gets stuck <laughs> like that. Oh, my gosh, I know. It could happen. Um... <laughs> So it's just, yeah, like, so we're not used to it, so uh, it becomes all the more important, I think, for us to really present our lives in such a way that people understand the joy and the hope that we live with, even in times of trial. Um, anyway, and that that's all stuff that he kind of talks about in the introduction, is basically the joy of the gospel, and um, in this... Uh, section of the new evangelization for the transmission of faith, he talks about um, basically three principal settings or areas where um, where the church has uh, a missionary call, basically. And the first one is in the area of ordinary pastoral ministry, um, which is basically just ministering to the faithful, like making sure that the people in the body of Christ, the church, have what they need day-to-day, um, -day, every Sunday, and everything they need. Sorry. What? Ugh. It feels weird to sit here. Maybe it's just because I'm blocking the screen for all of you. You're also too bad. Anyway. Yeah, what's up? I can't see the screen. I want to I'm shorter than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here you go, Carl. Um, uh, there. Now I can anyway, see myself. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> just what we need. Congratulations. Um, so we can feel extra awkward. Um, no, so the pastoral, ordinary pastoral ministry would just be like making sure that everybody has what they need um, for their own spiritual life, so that they can build up the church and go about their daily business of evangelizing elsewhere. Essentially, you know, like this is mm -hmm. this applies to priests who say mass and offer confession and all of these other sacraments, and it, it does 
it also applies to us, like maybe um, getting involved in like people documents group or yeah. other small group activities or whatever else you need in order to like build up the community around you and make sure that you're being spiritually fed. Um, the second setting that he talks about is, um, quote, the baptized whose lives do not reflect the demands of baptism. So people who were part of the church or maybe are Christian but not formally Catholic who just aren't living their lives that way. Maybe they go to Mass on Sundays, maybe they don't, but they're just not really associating themselves fully with the church. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I know... Nourished by their faith. Right? Yeah, like, I know a lot of people like that, like, you know, cradle Catholics who just kind of gave up on it once they reach high school, or, you know, they're away for whatever reason. A lot of times there's, like, particular sins involved that they are just, like, not ready or not willing to give up, you know, because it's hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, and sometimes, like, they just haven't had the faith explained properly to them. Like, I know... Um, Luckily, like, most of us are, are at parishes where, like, the priest is really solid. There's lots of resources for us to come to. There's a good RCIA program, all of these things. So these all help us, but we kind of forget because we're insulated in our little bubbles that that's not the case at other parishes. Um, <coughs> and Justin always talks about, like, when, when he was converting, basically, because um, he grew up outside of the church. Um, well, Inside, but not, not, not really. Not nourished <laughs> by your faith. Why am I? Because I I'm joined. Quit messing with stuff. <laughs> why, why do you have to join? You're here. Um, anyway, um, no, like coming coming into the church though, like you join the RCIA program, but you always say like if it weren't for like Mother Angelica and EWTN, you wouldn't have necessarily understood the faith. Yeah, I think a lot of that is you know you. Have <laughs> these groups that developed in the American Catholic Church that totally turned it into this hippie commune concept where, like, you've got your dancing mass, your clown mass, your mm. your happy clappy. I'm not talking charismatic. Like, your, your Muppet mass. I'm not talking authentic charismatic Ooh, mass. I'm, I'm never talking seen about a Muppet the, mass. <laughs> you, know, the, see <laughs> you know, we all love everybody. Yeah, like the weird, no the weird emasculating, yeah. like, there, it is mess. not a manly environment. <laughs> no. It is a, you look around the building and you're like, there's nothing really worth dying for here. Yeah. You know, so you walk into one of those old parishes where you know the big, huge wooden carved tabernacle. The entire community took part in building the place. The yeah. you know the statues, the the big choir loft, the grandiose mm -hmm. music and everything. That's yeah. something that. Something where the building itself proclaims yeah. like what we're there for. That's that can be really moving. I mean yeah. that spoke to me. When I started to hear <laughs> like chanted Latin, I'm like, where the heck was this all my life? You know, how yeah. how is this able to stay muted from my entire vision? Mm -hmm. I never heard like chant until after my conversion. And then I was like, Whoa, addicted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I never would have guessed. Yeah. So I, I went from <laughs> From listening to like Rancid and Operation Ivy and you know, No Effects to, you know, I'm not gonna the lie, Chanted Hail Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Hail Mary. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's sort of a weird culture shock, but I think um, that's also one of the things that the Pope kind of touches on very briefly um, when he's talking about joy, but also like the there's kind of a hook that beauty has. Um, in terms of like just just attracting people to the truth, like goodness, truth, and beauty, are like three things that kind of are universally acknowledged as goods that people can see and recognize, um, unless they've unless they've taught themselves not to specifically. You know, like yeah. we kind of have a, an instinctive reaction to these things, and um, one of the things that the church I think has to do is. Uh, work to continually build up that beauty. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's oh, often well. It's often the uh, the first the first um, sight that a person has of like a higher power. Like the the way those old churches were built, um, was it was specifically to elevate the people inside it. You know, 
or the people outside of it, because hey, Gothic Draw cathedrals look pretty cool from outside. Um, Draw them in! Draw them in! <laughs> it, but it is, yeah, like it draws them in and lifts them up, and that's something that gets kind of lost with like a lot of like plain, multi-purpose modern architecture and everything, you know. Um, I'm like, I've, I've heard this complaint about CTK from some people, and it's, you know, you're building on a budget, so you start with the bare bones and then you build it up as you can. And sometimes you forget that you buy extra buildings. While that's why I'm glad they put that stained glass yeah. on there. Because you walk in yeah. like, that's beautiful. That's, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a little bit too Sometimes, too design, sometimes you little... need to expand as a parish and you're just dealing with all that, you know. But, uh, but it's really, like, most of the, I think most of the churches that have, um, like, consistently, like, good attendance, um, people that understand why they're going and believe that it's important to go, a lot of them are the ones that have that structure already in place. Um, but it's something that we need to keep building up and make sure that we're communicating it to all people, like the ones that are going and the ones that we know that are just like, eh, Christmas of Easter, maybe. You know, things like that. Anyway. Um, I, I think that the, the kind of church I was talking about, the happy, clappy, hippie thing, that mm -hmm. cultivates what the Pope's talking about in the baptized whose lives do not reflect the, their, demands, of the demands of baptism. Yeah. That, that doesn't just happen. That's not like... Yeah. That's not something that somebody just falls into. That's actually being cultivated in certain churches mm -hmm. in America. And you can mm -hmm. see it. You go you go there and you're, you're like, well, why why choose this church instead of like any other... You know, it's, it's relative. It... it Cultivates yeah. relativism, like yeah, and, and you I know, think that's, here, there, anywhere, yeah. it's all the same. Yeah, you know, it's all that, there's well, no. Well, thinking about the art and the crack and, and oh, the yeah. skiing and oh yeah, yeah, the art. We call it the <laughs> art. Yeah. It's technically what Saint Francis. Saint Francis de Sales Parish. Yeah. I mean, the best you can say about that is it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it is very interesting to look at. It, from it's a unique side. design. Yeah, <laughs> externally. <laughs> I think and Paul, internally, Paul yeah. Schultz went up there and posted a picture of it because yeah. he did something for. Yeah, it's like, it's, hey, it's, it's, it's a few <laughs> it's a few blocks away from my grandma's house. So we're like, hey, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like it's it's weird, like, but I feel bad for like parishes where the best thing you can say about it is, well, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Just just a few miles away from the yeah. Ark is uh, St. Mary's Cathedral in downtown Muskegon, which is a gorgeous traditional church. Mm -hmm. Is it I'm is it ethnic? Is it like a Polish church? Um, I think so. There, there is some ethnic group. I yeah. want to say there's, um, there's heavy German. Polish German. and Dutch and German. I've um, noticed that it's the ethnic churches that have been able to you know maintain you know, that sense of culture because. Catholicism and Christianity in general, in <coughs> cultures that are imported, if you will, to America. <laughs> What's your you main know, import? Catholicism. You know, Catholicism um, is heavily ingrained in Polish culture. It is. And yeah. has been. You know, it's yeah, and especially, especially, yeah, yeah, especially in cultures that have dealt with like persecution and stuff. Who yeah. have basically had to cling to that sort of thing. Yeah. Because I'll say Stevens is heavily lot. Polish in culture yeah. and in... They're they're fairly faithful Catholics. Or um, Troy Saint Cyril Methodius. They're another one that Slovak are just parish. amazing. And they're Slovak. They're, they're they are like a Slovak missionary parish in the diocese yeah. or something. Yeah, like. they're super cool. Yeah, so there's something about that. Like there's yeah, it's just so we're heavily acculturated. And there's also yeah, Father from, John. Oh yeah. From Sir, from, from Cyril Cyril Methodius. Um, not here yeah. for reals. So disappointing. Um, anyway, no, like it's it's very very heavily enculturated, and I think they also also enculturated with that is the expectation mm -hmm. of following along, and we don't necessarily have that in like a like lazy American culture. Is that too terrible? Like I don't want to get down. American, on American culture wasn't originally not, lazy. The, I mean, yeah. you got to hand it to those the first Americans. Okay, they, they built, lazy generation Y. They must yeah. have themselves. They, they yeah, built established. an amazing their culture empire. Okay. Right. So um, anyway, yeah, but that's that's something we we need to think about. And um, the third area or principle setting that he talks about is those who. 
do not know Jesus Christ or who have always rejected him. Whatever you um, it's still It's still paragraph 15. It's just a long paragraph. Um, right here. Um, and um, a lot of them, he says, a lot of them are quietly seeking God. I think for us, typically it's more common to see somebody who's consistently rejected Jesus Christ and his church. Um, but oftentimes that is not... Um, fully understanding what the church is about, what Jesus is about, what Christianity is, really. Um, G.K. Chesterton said that uh, it's not that people reject the church, it's just that they reject what they think the church is, <clears throat> or what they think the church teaches. Um, so I think I think there's at least an element of truth to that. Like, there are, there are some people that know, that really know what the church believes, and there's, you know, that that oh, sin that's hardened them or whatever it is that they just really want to cling to, like instead of salvation. <laughs> yeah. But um, but I think I think uh, there is at least a pretty good element of truth to that because we live in what at least used to be a predominantly Judeo Christian culture. And that's that applies all through the Americas and Europe and good chunks of other parts of the world. And we don't often find in our own life experience, unless we go somewhere else that's vastly different. Anybody who's never heard of Jesus, or anybody who's never heard of the Catholic Church or anything, but they don't necessarily have a clear vision of what the church teaches or why. Like, a lot of them kind of know, like, oh, the church doesn't like gay people, right? Or, the church says you can't use the pill, right? You know, because the media likes to talk about these hot-button issues, but they don't really understand, like, Context. What we know about the nature of the human person. And then there's a, lot of, about, there's a lot of yeah. these churches where <coughs> I'd feel bad telling somebody, oh, just go to your local church and, you yeah. and experience yeah, exactly. it for yourself. Right. When you, yeah, yeah, when you can't, like, you know, yeah, I'm just like, church okay, church okay, I yeah. you, yeah, like, I will bring you. Like, okay, come 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 the, yeah. <laughs> the majority of the Catholic parishes, and it is getting better. I'm seeing yeah. a, a turnover in the priesthood finally. That's true. But it seems like it took this this priest scandal to finally wake people up. Like, hey, there's actually actually a faction in the Catholic Church that is dedicated to obliterating the yeah, Catholic kind Church. Of ruining and it, in yeah. one of the worst ways possible, you know, right. attacking kids. <laughs> right. So, but um, I wanted to go back to 14, the end of 14, because oh. that was this the last uh, sentence in 14. Well, that's what we've been talking about, the three principles. Yeah, settings, right? no, but this is the point okay. that the media took and grabbed a hold of and started to bash authentic Catholics for proselytizing. Oh. The Pope says, it is not by proselytizing that the church grows, but by attraction. And I, I still kind of have a hard time with this, especially that, that whole part, it, the uh, just before that as well. Uh, instead of uh, seeming to impose new obligations, that that whole part about like when I'm in my conversion, uh, I'll be frank. I knew I had a whole set of obligations that I yeah. needed to follow. I had to burn my pornography. I had to stop going to underage drinking parties. I had to. Uh, you well, know, to be clear, I, had to, I had to start seeking out my Yeah, faith. you I didn't stop. stop those at first, though, did you? Like, you didn't no, stop right. going to the parties and stuff until you realized that... No, it was a 180 that day. I I, okay. I went out to the parties, like, <coughs> every once in a while, but it wasn't as, like, it wasn't just... It wasn't, you drink it, or it whatever, was yeah. dragging my feet, you know? It was yeah. kind of like, you know, getting goaded into it. Yeah. But, uh... But it was that kind of stuff that was doing a conversion in me that yeah. I found attractive. So I, 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 I have a hard time with this part, and then I don't understand it, especially in the context of right after that he starts talking about needing to, in 15, quoting John Paul II, the missionary task must remain foremost, and we cannot passively and calmly wait in our church buildings and stuff like that. Like, right. we have to go out. Maybe it's not like the attitude with which you do it. Yeah. So if you're, like, imposing new obligations, that seems more like 
right. ruling with an iron fist, whereas I think that you can encourage people yeah. to impose those boundaries on themselves by sharing joy and yeah. you know, That's pointing true. to a new horizon. So maybe it's just the way in which yeah. you do it. So that then they're imposing the obligations right. on themselves because they're moved by you. Oh, um, yeah, I think there's there's like a certain degree of sense because um, I think a lot of people know, at least in their heart of hearts, that um, their their lifestyles or the sins that they're pursuing are not ultimately making them happy. And there can be a lot of despair that comes along with that. And and a lot of people understand that there needs to be a change, even if they don't know where to start or how to go about that. Um, so if they see yeah. us, if they see us living a joyful life and knowing that like our lives are radically different from theirs, it kind of opens it up to the question of like, what are you doing different? Like, what do you have that I don't have? You know? Because I, I can see that being a huge point of despair, especially with the the kind of stuff contraception injects into a lifestyle. I mean, yeah. you know, my mom's heard it like a bunch of times. If if I went off contraception, my my husband would leave me. Yeah. That becomes something that's like, wow. Like, yeah. Oh, that's if I converted to Catholicism yeah. and actually, yeah. 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 If I converted right. to Catholicism and actually did what they said, it would break up my family. That yeah. that that is not good. That's Therefore, huge. I will not convert. Yeah. Yeah. So I can, you know, these are real dynamics that. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Like. Struggle with. She's she's heard that from a lot of women, and she had to kind of question that herself for a little while. Like, is this is this serious enough that, like, you know, am I convicted enough by this that I'm really willing to pursue it? Even um, even some family members of ours uh, who had gotten a tubal ligation actually after having their first three kids, um. Just went for that because they felt, you know, like they had been inundated by a culture that says, like, well, you have to be responsible with the number of kids you have, and right. the more kids you have, the more ways you got to slice up the pie, that yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So they just went ahead and did it, and then later on, after coming closer to the church and like really understanding mm -hmm. what we believe about the human person and about sexuality, they ended up like going and having a reversal and having. Uh, so far, three more kids and a fourth on the way, you know. <laughs> so it's something that can make a huge difference in people's lives, and I think most people understand that, like, there is change involved and would be willing to do that if it's important enough. But we need to like present it in such a way that, like, they understand these changes are for your for your good, for the overall improvement of your life, your happiness, and your final end, you know. And that's it's something, something that, to be joyful about, not necessarily like in despair, like, uh, like how yeah. you have the other rules. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's something anyway. So that's what chat. That's paragraph fifteen. Um, yeah, I actually really liked the uh, the quote that he added from Luke chapter fifteen. The just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than ninety nine righteous per persons who need no repentance. You know, which is striking, and I'm kind of offended by that because I'm a cradle Catholic. This is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but it's—I mean, we all have—we all have sin that we all need to work on. It's just yeah. like getting to that point, you know. <clears throat> so anyway, I guess um, moving on, unless anybody has anything to add. Little girl. She's not sure about the green beans, I think. But you know um, what? That's okay. Learn to love them. <laughs> They're good for us. <laughs> 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 it's, like, oh my <laughs> it's the joy of the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> joy of the green beans. Yay! Yay. All right. So, um, paragraph 16 starts the scope and limits of this exhortation, and that's just. Every bite. Did you make? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, what, is, what is going on? <laughs> You're too distracting, baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I guess yeah, chapter or paragraphs sixteen and seventeen are just kind of for our own personal information, like what this exhortation is going to cover, and it's basically um, um, he's writing this at the behest of the the synod of bishops, um, 
to talk about, especially about uh, the new evangelization. Um, and first off, like he's he's got kind of a principle of subsidiarity approach here. He's like, you know, like there are a lot of like particulars that may apply to one particular area. Like you, these bishops have noticed this problem that their people specifically are dealing with, but it may not be for everyone. So there's there's room for like pastoral judgment and prudential judgment involved here. And it's not the Pope's job necessarily to lay out a thick like rule for every single person across the globe. You know, it's just thoughts on on the I basics. I don't think that would cultivate the no. the spirit of attentiveness to the Holy Spirit right. that we should all have as evangelists ourselves. I mean, if we're yeah. if we got to constantly refer to a manual, I mean, we've, we've got we've got we that, have a manual, got the <laughs> but like. In day-to-day -day interactions with people, there are so many dynamics. There's not, a, right. it's not rational to, to go around with, like a book and be like blah blah blah. I mean, yeah. And the way, and the way, like the way you would approach a stranger, like if you were street preaching or whatever, is going to be vastly different from the way you approach like a longtime friend or family member that's away from the church, you know, because you're cultivating a very different relationship in the midst of all this. Um, so, like, you know, in that same way, like, you, you approach these different situations differently, and that's going to be true, like, across the globe as well. So, um, so he's just laying out, basically, um, on the basis of the teaching of Lumen Gentium, which I'm sure you've all read, right? Yes, yes. I did. I've read it. <laughs> I started when it. When I was a theology major, so then I'm like, I don't count. Whatever. I had to read it for a test. I've read it. <laughs> You're familiar with it. Probably right? tons of chunks. Of oh yeah, you know, at this you know. point, I'm sure. Um, anyway, ah, so probably, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> True confession. Oh man. <laughs> All right. Um, so anyway, yeah. So he's just using Lumen Gentium along with like a lot of like church fathers and John Paul II and Benedict the Sixteenth as a guide for. All of these thoughts, um, basically covering the reform of the church in her missionary outreach, mm -hmm. the temptations faced by pastoral workers, the church understood as the entire people of God which evangelizes, the homily and its preparation, the inclusion of the poor in society, that will be the section that everybody got all fired up about. Um, Which one? The, the inclusion of the poor in society. That's E, letter E. I'm down, I'm down in paragraph 17. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> peace and dialogue within society and the spiritual motivations for mission, basically. Um, so, he says, I love this guy and his humility. I have dealt extensively with these topics with a detail which some may find excessive. <laughs> which is a nice way of saying, like, I get really wordy about this and I probably didn't need to. But whatever. Um, so anyway, so the first the first section that we're going to cover, we're going to start getting into chapter one, the church's missionary transformation, and I think we're going to stop like I don't know after this first bit, a church which goes forth. So this is going to be the this the beginning of the section that talks about the reform of the church in her missionary outreach, um, and I think. A lot of this section is not going to be anything particularly new for us. Like we've all been presumably listening to homilies and such, so we've you know we've heard these gospel messages and stuff before. Um, so like we we all know that like Abraham received a call to set out for a new land. Moses heard God heard God's call to go where he said where he was being sent, and um, Jeremiah and Jesus' command to go and make disciples in all nations, you know, this has been like a continual recurring theme and I think that just, we probably picked up on. I think it's just showing us that evangelization is something that God calls the individual out to do. Exactly. God's got a purpose. It's not yeah. you that has the purpose. It's not you creating a purpose. It's you being attentive to the, to the emotions of the Holy Spirit. So this is yeah. Build something. Right, right. Well, this is. I mean, just like all of these passages here. Right. I mean, even even when you look at um, the word mission, is of the same root as the word mass, and it just means to be sent. 
Like that's that's the whole point of it all, really, is to be sent out. So like, it's something that we forget, and we tend to like, especially when our society is not being altogether friendly to Christianity. I mean, we we go through phases, and that's normal throughout human history, where like everything's easy, so we get kind of lazy about it. Like, we're surrounded by a lot of Christians, so we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about the state of things. And then things kind of start turning around, and it gets really ugly. And our first instinct, our first reaction is often to, like, huddle up and, like, form a little tight-knit bubble and not worry about what's going on outside, <laughs> you know? Yes. And that has the opposite hunker effect. Down in our churches. Yeah, 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 we hunker down in our churches. And, um... And that's, you know, that's that's an instinct to protect the church, but that's not what we're here for. And that's, you know, something that can be really, really intimidating. For a lot of people, especially, like, I know a lot of people that are just not outspoken, not confrontational, and that he's not calling for confrontation or argument as such. He's just calling us to, like, go out and be... Yes! <laughs> we are called to be witnesses to our faith. Yeah. Well, it, that's kind of neat, though. Like you are being called the exact same way Moses is being called, the exact same way as Jeremiah. You're not called to do the same thing, but that is still there. It's. It, I mean, I think it resonates. If you if you're here, something's resonated in your heart. I mean, everyone who tastes that. Fulfillment that only God gives realizes, well, I gotta give back. I gotta be more attentive. I've gotta be open to, you know, what I'm supposed to do. Right. So that's great that we can that he, You know, He's helping us here to identify with Moses in that mm -hmm. whole way. Yeah. So there is, yeah, like we have, we have this reiteration of, of like the joy, the joy of the gospel, and and showing that joy to other people and, and being alive with it, the joy and hope of the gospel, which can be hard, of course, because we all have, like, the things that we're struggling with in our daily lives, and we forget that, like, we're really supposed to be paying attention to these movements of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, and then we then we go on to this part that, that I really, I tend to struggle with, at least myself, um, the idea that uh, God's word is unpredictable in its power and the gospel speaks of the seed which once sown grows by itself even as the farmer sleeps. Um, and he talks about basically that like it's our responsibility, like Jesus does not stay behind to explain things or perform more signs. The spirit moves him to go forth to other towns. And that goes against my instinct where like, I want everything to be very like correct and precise. I have to and see not leave it alone until yeah. I know like you've got it right this time, you know. I work hard <laughs> to establish this, and I want to see its final. Right. And the, not you like see the fruit. Oh, I gotta also. I gotta move on to the next thing now. Right. Yeah. Just hope so that. Yeah, oh, like it's yeah. very hard to give that up and be detached from that. And I think that part of that is might be cultural, or or at least more recent in culture. You mm -hmm. know, you need to be accountable, and you know follow it through and yeah. you know that's my job you know I have right. to make sure it's finished and, and that's not necessarily, necessarily always the there case. are certain yeah. elements in life where you do need to do that I mean, right yeah but yeah. Dude, the gospel is something that once it catches fire it's it is a living thing that happens yeah. I mean you, you you're not in charge of someone else's mm -hmm. spiritual life you're right. in charge of presenting them the gospel yeah and there is, yeah, like it's, oh, she's, oh, that's sorry. Right. No, it's either going to be snoring or the growling, whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's very, very difficult, I think, though, to, to be detached from that. And um, and I probably wouldn't worry about it so much if, uh, if I didn't know that there were so many, like, people claiming to be Catholic that aren't really, you know, like, I, so I feel that like... Influences yeah, the like, it's kind, to of, deter it's kind of my job to defend against the Nancy Pelosi's and Joe Biden's of the world. It's, you know, I'm like, okay, you know that I'm Catholic, but do you really know what Catholics are like? Because you might not, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, so it's very hard to let that go and, like, and just let people know, like, hey, the Catholic Church has something to offer, and let it go with that, or like, you know, plant that seed, but just kind of let it go, and not have to worry about what it leads them to. 
like, but it's my job to worry. But, but at the same time, like, yeah, like, at the same time, if we're living authentically Catholic lives, like, as a matter of course, like, as a matter of habit, throughout our entire day-to-day life, if we're living as authentic Catholics, we don't have to worry about giving people a false impression, you know? So that's something that I at least really have to work on. Yeah. And I think part of our responsibility, too, is to allow that room for the Holy Spirit to take root in mm-hmm. other people around us. You know, I'll, I'll give God a chance. Uh, I think history's proven that you ain't going to micromanage the work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> what do you mean? You know, it's a continual learning process for ourselves, yeah. I think. That's true. You yeah. know, letting, letting go and letting God. Yeah. I think that becomes an even greater testimony to the authenticity of the Catholic Church. Yeah. And we've got we've got true diversity. And there are so many expressions of the faith within the Catholic Church. And not not one of them takes dominant control. It's yeah. all allowed to be expressed that way. Yeah. The Catholic Church in Africa has all the forms of Catholicism, but there is an expression that's vastly different than what we've got, you know. Right. Around here. Yeah, there's a plurality there that that makes it. Or you look at it from uh, from religious group to religious group, like the Dominicans, vastly different than the Franciscans, vastly different than the uh, Carthusians, Carthusians and the yeah. Jesuits or the Carmelites yeah. or mm-hmm. the Carmelites or Franciscans, I guess. Yeah. Anyway. But, okay. no. I digress. No, but it's but it is true. Like, there are, like I mean, we all we all believe in the same God, and there there are obviously like certain points of dogma and doctrine that we all agree on. But the expression can be sorry um, can be different depending on like your own state in life and the particular. Um, hey, bud. Now I lost my train of thought. Shoot. Um. The particular something. Planting the seed and moving on. I got nothing now. Okay. It's cool. Um. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> and and really like all that all that he talks about that I was really getting in paragraph twenty four is basically like just being ready to go out, um, making sure that you are continually being renewed and being involved taking a step forward, like, at all times. Not necessarily, like, following through on every detail and micromanaging, but just being ready to take that first step wherever the Holy Spirit kind of gives you a nudge. Um, Being willing to be in, like, uncomfortable situations or situations that you don't normally seek out, which is terrible. (laughs) Yeah, sometimes they find you, you know. Or, like, you find yourself like, you yeah, know, I'm not particularly motivated to do this, or, like, this is not how I normally approach people, but, okay, bye. <laughs> but, we, but we do have to be ready for that, and we need to also be making sure that, like, in our own spiritual lives, we're um, fit and prepared for that sort of thing. And God offers us all that we need. He, he gives us all of the graces, all of the resources and knowledge that we need. Um, you know, like in terms of reading material, we're all like standing on the backs of giants here. You know, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but we need to we need to just be like spiritually ready for that when the time comes. So, there was a no quote, pressure. There was a quote from Death Dynasty. Oh. It has to deal with love, and I bring it up because in twenty four he's talking about you know because you know, love. He's oh, saying yeah. uh, advice to two. You know, two young people, you know, they thinking they're going to live on love. You know. mm-hmm. Or, or how, how, how are you going to feed yourselves? Oh, we'll live on love. That, you'll starve. <laughs> yeah. you got to do something. you yeah. got to you know, love, love isn't just a feeling, you know. Yeah. Love, love, love for Christ isn't just this, oh, I know my creator. I'm all done. I did it. <laughs> no, love, love yeah. for the creator is an active Engaging mm-hmm. thing that you know <laughs> you never you never get it through your whole life you never you never 
fully yeah, flesh that really out. You're never, you're never comfortable. I have not been comfortable <laughs> since my conversion. <laughs> when I reflect on it, I have always been called into these situations where I don't have a roadmap. I don't mm -hmm. have... I mean, I've got people that I can confide in and get advice, and you know, but God says that you know, there's a blessing. Uh, you know, the, the decision maker that has lots of counsel is blessed, or something along those lines. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But okay. you know, that, that's about the best you get. You know, yeah. you're trying to flesh out. You're, try, yeah, you're trying. Yeah, you're basically to, constantly discerning. Like, what am I supposed to do here? You're trying to figure <laughs> out something that has never been done before, and that's yeah. you taking part. In some kind of action that involves other people. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. That's fun. I don't know. What do you do? You think we should stop there because it's at three thirty now. We're getting close to thirty. Yeah. Let's, let's, I'm I'm okay with keeping know, going. If you can keep talking. Are you guys still alive? Going. Still awake, Carl? You're not falling asleep. Yeah. Carl's flipping up and down and up and oh, down. Oh, I see how it is. <laughs> Just trying well, to look was, busy. I, I see how it is. Out, I was testing out the scrolling. <laughs> 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 I see. Sure. I was testing these tools for the oh, new evangelization. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Seriously. All right. So I guess we can move on there. Um, uh, section 2, Pastoral Activity and Conversion. Um, uh -huh. I know, super important, right? Uh, yeah, so basically, like, he, he kind of gets around here. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to express here <laughs> has a programmat programmatic significance and, and important consequences. So basically, like, pastoral activity, um, and I kind of view this as, like, being predominantly um, directed towards people that are in charge of, you know, parishes or small groups or other other groups like just administering, like just making sure that like managing the parish. Yeah, management is taken care of is not enough because we need to be going for it. Like we're not just here to sustain what's already there. We're trying to go out and then draw people back in. You know, <coughs> like going going on our way towards heaven and pointing back towards the cross. Yeah, it's like kind we're of going to see more. Yeah, like we're supposed to, we're supposed to be continually building up the church, not just maintaining. You know, <laughs> kid. Um, Make sure you close the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> he forgets sometimes. Anyway, um, yeah. So the uh, the church uh, basically is is being called to. A renewal that that means like we can't just be sitting here maintaining what we've already got, what we've already been given. We essentially be wasting our talents. We need to actually like take these gifts and run with them in whatever way God is calling you to do. In particular, um, whatever fits you, your personality. Like the church acknowledges, like yeah, we all have our own personalities, our own gifts, our own charisms that we are expected to use. Um, sometimes in ways that will make us like extremely <laughs> uncomfortable, and other times just you know through how you live your life. Yeah. Um, but but we need to be cognizant of it and make sure that we are continually going to God for renewal and continually pointing the way for others, basically. <coughs> just like Mary points the way to Christ. Um, did you have anything else to add in paragraphs like 25 and 26? Anybody? Not you? Okay. Um, ecclesial renewal, which cannot be deferred. Um, I dream of a missionary option. That is, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. Um, <laughs> so that's basically what we've been talking about. Like we need to, we need to channel our work not just towards. I mean, clearly we need to like take care of what we have, but we also need to be bringing it forward. Um, and I think in a lot of ways that means that frankly we need to get more people active and involved than currently are. Like when I think of a typical parish, you know, oftentimes it's the same few people 
that are running things, like all the activities, all your day-to-day -day management, come, trying to come up with new ideas, and they're always like begging for more people to give their time and energy. What are you doing? <laughs> Isn't it like seven percent of the church does like ninety nine percent of the work? Yeah. yeah. This is one of the things I say to those people oh who will post a picture of the pope with a Silly sitting guy. on a golden chair and thing, and it will be that meme that says, uh, "Serve the poor. You're doing it wrong." Yeah. And I'm like, well. That you, you kind of miss the point. It's not money that fixes anything. It's people. And the church doesn't have yeah. the vibrance of people to go yeah. out and do all that. They we're working on you know, 7% participation, you know, to use yeah. that number. Yeah, and that's kind of like ridiculous and unfortunate. And I know like a lot of us tend to get caught up in our own lives and I'm like, you know, like I'm serving, I'm serving four kids all day. I don't have time for other people. What? That's crazy. Father Pat said something striking today. <laughs> oh, Father Pat. Can you Daily say it Mass. in the Father Pat voice? Uh, no. Uh, oh. um, <laughs> he, <laughs> he was talking about how it was difficult to get people to be a reader at Mass. Really? But it's uh, Yeah, it's, it's difficult, difficult to find readers. But he does have a lot of people that are always and always volunteering, which are just as a, a nuisance as the people who don't want to do it. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting, because yeah. you, you're, you're talking about the two, so like, well, you're talking about the two extremes. The two extremes, like, like people that don't want to, like, step aside and let other people take part. Yeah. yeah. So and it's the kind of like, just aren't willing to try. it was neat that he pointed that out, because, hmm. you know, one thing about Father Patty is very critical about most things. And, <laughs> <laughs> what? No. Know, and then, and that just goes to show you that the church needs the diversity, because, you know, he hits on things that not every priest would hit on. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a just a simple little dynamic there. Like, mm -hmm, yeah. you know, you, you can never be settled. Don't think that you're doing everything right because you're doing all these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you you're doing all that is making it so that other More people difficult. aren't stepping forward. Yeah, my the job is being taken care of, so why should I volunteer? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so, or like, what more can I possibly contribute? And it's, I can't possibly I can't do better than they can. Yeah, and it and it is true. Like I was, I was just thinking um, as I was reading through this earlier today. Uh, again, that Mark Barnes article that we read a while back about um, he has no bad Catholic Mark Barnes. Bad Catholic blog. It's super oh, good. On you guys are missing some stuff. It's oh, really like bad, highly bad recommend. Bad. I'll send out a link later or something. But he's like one of my favorite bloggers. He's a, he was a student at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Um, and he is pretty brilliant. Like he's he was what, he's young like, too. I think he was like seventeen or eighteen when he started writing, and now he's like twenty twenty one. Um, and just really, really like he thinks things through and presents it in a way that has like really good appeal. I think for like younger generations and for like atheists and snarky people. And I'm a snarky person, so this counts. Um, <laughs> But no, like he he wrote it he wrote an article um, a few months ago. I don't even remember what the title was now. It was basically about like feeding the poor and like why why we feel uncomfortable just kind of handing out money to like homeless people. And um, you know, like people tend to use the defense like, oh, I don't want them to use the money for drugs or for alcohol or whatever. Like I don't want to give them money if they're just going to use it for something that's bad for them. Basically. Mm -hmm. um, which I understand, like, it's kind of, like, it's kind of legitimate. Like, we don't want to be contributing to something that is harmful for them, ultimately. But what we really mean when we say that is not, I'm not willing to give them money. It's, I'm not willing to give my time to make sure that they don't use the money in that way. Like, I'm not really willing to give more of myself, um, so I'm just not going to give it all. Because really, like, we could help them in a true and authentic way if we were willing to like take the time, know them as a person, uh, direct them to where they need to go to get more help, you know, um, or help them ourselves if we're capable of doing that, you know, like building up a real relationship there rather than just acting like tossing money at the problem will yeah. actually help in a significant way or will just contribute to more ruin. And yeah, you could really go and buy them a meal and then talk yeah. to them while they eat it and 
Yeah. If you don't know their name by the time you walk away from them, you you've kind of you kind of done something for yourself, not for them, you know. Yeah, and I always I always tend to have like a hard time doing that. Like I'm usually if I'm driving around, like I've got the kids with me. I'm like, you know, I'm not going to stop and chat with four kids in the car to this strange man on the side of the road, you know. Um, <coughs> so, like, of course it's not always an option, and you have to use some prudential judgment. But um, but that's really, I think, what it boils down to. Like, we spend, we, we all tend to spend a lot of time uh, doing things that we're very comfortable and make us feel good, and... All of this stuff, and not necessarily enough time looking outward and trying to discover what other people need. Um, and it's like that's something that like our dad was really, really good at. Frankly, like he would he would just kind of see a need and fill it, and it wouldn't even like you didn't even have to ask him twice. Um, you and they didn't always even have to ask him. Yeah, yeah. Half the time you wouldn't it, like. I mean, he would. He always had stuff going on. Like he wasn't even working full time. Um, before he died, like for months, years, really. Um, we went out to lunch was... once, and he said, if you don't act on an impulse that God gives you within two days, you're probably not going to do it. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I've seen that happen so many cool. times in my life. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so he had that spirit of it, about him. He's very yeah. diligent Just, in yeah. doing whatever... Whatever it was, that he was yeah. So like, and it and it was in like a weird myriad of ways, you know. Like he would come over like before the baby was born, he was coming over every week to watch my other kids so I could go to the doctor, you know. Mm -hmm. Just show up at like nine o'clock in the morning, watch the kids for an hour, and that was cool, you know. He was sixty-five and he was still helping people move. Like they would call him. <laughs> if he was here right now, he would be on the ground <laughs> with. One of the kids just crawling on him, with them. yeah, <laughs> all the time, you know. And and he would do this in like different ways. And like he was an accountant, trained as an accountant, so he would help out like friends of the family with their businesses or whatever else he could do, like any way that he could help. And even if it was something like, I mean, he had total tenure, but he was a deacon, so he would do like intoning for different chants and stuff like that. <laughs> And it was, it was always horrendous, but it was just it was like, you know, so this is something like... It was enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those things, like, you know, this is something that, like, God has called me to do, and I'm not comfortable, but I'm going to have the humility to just go up there and do it anyway, you know. <laughs> um, so it was just, like, it's just one of those things, like, this is, this is a good example, like, prime example for me to, like, just kind of put myself out there and fill whatever need has to be filled, you know. Yep. Um, even if it's something you've never done before, or even if you almost hit the bishop in the head with a with a censor or whatever, you know. <laughs> like, it could happen. You gotta do what you gotta do. What number are we on? Um, that's number twenty-seven, twenty-eight. All right, let's kick through yeah. almost a thirty. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, so uh, basically, in he's, he's talking about in 28, like, in any given parish, in any given area, whatever, like, what you really ought to be doing is not just maintaining as a parish, but you ought to be training all your members of the parish to be evangelizers, you know, and, and doing whatever you need to do. Like, it's not always feasible necessarily to have, like, formal classes, but, um, you know, one of your one of your serious duties as a pastor would be to be like giving great homilies so that people have like actual meat to grab hold of and bring to other people, you know. Substance. Um, yes, it's crazy what a different substance makes. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, and and just kind of teaching them to like work with dialogue, work with like proclaiming the gospel, even if it's just in small ways. Um, and uh, Let's see. Yeah, and to and to give them opportunities to bring them nearer to people. Um, I think this is one of the like the great things that like we're seeing at our parish is like the the formation of a lot of different kinds of small groups. Um, and there can always be more, but like things that things that attract certain people like to a particular 
niche or whatever. Like it's not necessarily not everybody not wants everyone to go loves to a Bible study. Paper documents. No, <laughs> everyone loves paper documents. I don't know what you're talking about. You brush your teeth. <laughs> we have a lot of toothbrushes in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, I mean, not everybody needs a papal documents group. Not everybody wants a Bible study, you know. But like, finding finding different opportunities and ways to bring people nearer to others. Like, if you can get involved in, you know, a soup kitchen. Or a Bible study, or a men's breakfast, or you know. Which yeah. car is going to get? <laughs> yeah, you are. Who's it? Do it. Um, awesome. Anyway, yeah. So like, if you can, if you can find ways to like get yourself involved, bring yourself closer to people. That's really, ultimately, what we're trying for is just giving yourself opportunities to become close to people, to show them the light of Christ. Um, <coughs> And, uh, and that's that's true of every particular church and also of every diocese. So this is something that bishops need to be thinking about, like how, how to form their parishes, how to encourage this, um, like in a diocesan-wide, I don't want to say appeal because that always makes people think of the DSA yeah. stuff. But that's no fun. Um, but really, like to, to find ways to, to deal with this, and this is not like... We have a lot of things working against us because I think in a lot of parishes, like people almost tune out when they hear the bishop speaking, which is terrible. Like we we tend to get used to like oh the bishop's talking must be about the DSA, you know, or or thinking that like you know whatever the bishop is saying like yeah it's nice but it's not going to be anything new or particularly important to me personally, you know, things like that. So like. What Unless you've got within our minds to make ourselves stand up and pay attention, right? Or like, or ain't nobody got time for that, you know? Like, cause who wants to go through and read everything that, like, every letter that their bishop is writing? Um, you know, like I haven't even caught up on all of my Pope Francis writing letters. Everything <laughs> my bishop has written, you know. But it's true. Like, we we kind of we'll catch it up now. Yeah, we are. We have this attitude, so like we've we've got to be really conscious of like what our bishop is doing, what our bishop is encouraging, what our parishes are doing. If there's anything that our parish is doing, or like our friends or other communities are doing, we can get involved in. This is something that you need to be cognizant of. And like, <laughs> he just my sister text messaged me, so I responded. Mm. So well, why isn't she here? <laughs> you were texting when we first got here. She's in Minneapolis. So. <laughs> she can make a drive. I mean, shared a lot of questions. Gosh. What are you doing building up relationships while you're supposed to be reading papal documents? <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so there's there was just a bit from the Second Vatican Council which was not the Third Vatican Council, by the way, in case anybody heard that that was the third one. <laughs> Did you, oh, there isn't a third one. Did you hear the rumor, though? There was a funny, yeah. like, some satire blog had posted something about, like, Pope Francis declaring all religions tr true at the end of the Third Vatican Council. <laughs> one of my friends. something on the onion. Yeah, yeah. Well, then it, yeah, but then it caught on and people thought it was legit and like one of my friends was like, hey, did you hear this? And I was like, you know that's not even remotely Gosh. true, right? Oh my god. I should have looked at that a little closer. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe check your Vatican News with the Vatican website. Pretty sure they would have put something up about it. I don't know. But, uh, but it's really like... Um, the Second Vatican Council says, uh, like the ancient patriarchal churches, Episcopal conferences are in a position to contribute in many and fruitful ways to the concrete realization of the collegial spirit. Um, and this desire has not yet been fully realized since the juridical status of Episcopal conferences, which would see them as subjects of specific uh, attributions, including genuine doctrinal authority, has not been sufficiently elaborated. So basically, like this hasn't this hasn't proved super fruitful as of right now because we're just not quite sure where this fits in doctrinally. And like you know, like we have the USCCB, 
which does some really good things, and other things are like, you guys, come on. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of tricky, like, figuring out, like, exactly where, um, you know, the stuff that the USCCB points out falls on the scale of, like, should we take this seriously or not? Like, should we really follow through the, with this or not, you know? I am sorry. Um, the force of freedom, I think, is such a waste of time and energy. And so at a time where we could be hey. really engaging these social issues, this Fortnite for Freedom just totally yeah. detracts from it, in my opinion. Well, you just admitted... Do you guys even know what the Fortnite for Freedom is? That it takes all kinds. <laughs> yes. It's the bishop's response to the religious liberty Issue. attacks. Like from the HHS. And the fact that you guys don't even know it proves, that proves it my case. Of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. Is that like 40 days for life? No, it's yeah, not it's quite... It's, yeah. a, it's a different group, yeah. Um, yeah, the Fortnite, Fortnite for Freedom, freedom it was just those like... We meetings um, outside <laughs> with the HHS where you were stop HHS. Basically, yeah. Buttons. Yeah. Kind of. It's kind been... Of. Well, like, it was along with that, yeah. You see... I mean, Monica they would have Miller like a Fortnite of prayer and fasting. Monica and Miller and like Eric Scheidler did those things, the religious freedom rallies. Yeah. Yeah. And when they did that, the bishops did these Fortnite for Freedoms, and then all of a sudden it became like, what, what, what huh? Yeah. This is the same thing? It's like... <laughs> Different uh, thing, really? Why? Yeah. Well, what was wrong with Fortnite for Freedom? <coughs> Do you know yeah. what Fortnite for Freedom is? It's just ineffective. Yeah. yeah <laughs> very, very, very ineffective. Yeah. In a fork yeah. at night. <laughs> Daddy, yeah. Do you, like but when you say like the word Fortnite, when you say the word <laughs> Fortnite. How many people? I think of two weeks. That how many people's ears perk up when they hear Fortnite for Freedom? Do you Not know mine. what a semi is? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's you know, word. it's it's it is. <laughs> good use of Fs. Yeah. Good job. Fortnite for Freedom, and let's see, but there was these foam <laughs> number one figures that said F four F. No and I saw Cardinal Dolan. Oh, Let really? me see what I find here. F4F. I never saw that. Yeah. F or F. Nobody even knows what that means. That's weird. Because see, these, these <laughs> religious freedom rallies, these are different from the Fortnite for Freedom. Uh, really, I saw it as just a trying to s <laughs> sabotage the momentum of the religious freedom rallies is okay. what it ended up doing, in my opinion. Anyway, so really quick, chapter th or paragraph 33 before we end this, um, basically, like, he encourages pastors and, and other people who might be in charge of various things, like, don't, don't become complacent and just think that you should go along with things just because we've always done it this way, you know. Sometimes you need to be able to change things, change the dynamics, and follow through on these things. Like, he, he wants us all to take Stupid. very seriously the... Uh, the instructions and guidelines that he's giving us here and like figure out like if there is something that really needs to change within your diocese, within your parish, um, within your archdiocese, whatever, like try and figure <laughs> out a way to do that. And, and in the meantime, like the church as a whole and like the, the cardinals and bishops and the pope are also working on what to do from their end, basically. Hands <coughs> on deck. All yeah. hands on deck. Yeah. It's an emergency, you guys. So, I guess we will stop there, unless anybody else has something to add. Yeah. I have a sleeping bag. That's fine. Right. You've done your job. Well played. All set, man. Stop right now. Thank you, anybody who's watched this all the way through. You're crazy <laughs> like us. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys.